whole fleet of them. Look on the ASA. My gosh. They're all going against the wind. It was basically a cube with inside of a sphere where the points of the cube uh, were touching outside of the sphere. So this isn't anything that just is limited to the United States. It's a worldwide phenomenon. That UFO podcast is powered by Zencaster. Zencaster is one of the world's leading platforms for recording and hosting podcasts. Zencaster is a modern web-based solution for high-quality audio and video podcast production. With a full suite of professional tools, Zencaster allows podcasters to quickly and seamlessly record their guests remotely and produce their podcasts in studio quality. Check out the links in the show description to find out more. Join over 2 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free shipping with the code ANDYUFO at manscaped.com. I'm one of the first people to try the new 4.0 and I am blown away by the performance. The craftsmanship and details on the 4.0 are next level, generations ahead of where it should be. The advanced ceramic blade and skin safe technology is so good that it almost seems as if Manscaped worked with At S4 with Bob Lazar and others to ensure your saucers are as safe as possible. This is David Marler, UFO researcher, and you're listening to That UFO Podcast. Hi everyone and welcome back to That UFO Podcast. As always, my name is Andy and I've been looking forward to this one. I've said many times on the podcast I love discussing UFOs, UAP, aliens and all that entails, but I've got a proper thing for remote viewing. It's one of my secret passions to talk about, a bit of a guilty pleasure as well. So I'm very excited to welcome remote viewer, clairvoyant and author, among many things, Deborah Katz to the podcast. Deborah, how are you? Yes, thank you, Andrew. I'm happy to be here with you. Yeah, listen, um, loads of interest in this one whenever we do have, and, and they're few and far between, I should really do more, but remote viewing episodes, um, a lot of interest, a lot of questions off the back of these as well. And um, I think it's a good time to speak to you because there's a lot going on in the world of remote viewing. You've got a book coming out. There is the IRVA conference coming up as well. And I've just heard you on Coast to Coast, which gave me a whole load more questions to ask you on top of, of everything else. So, Deborah, if you're good, let's get right into it. Um, Deborah, I want to discuss with you a little bit first your background. And for me, at what age do you realize you have some sort of extrasensory ability or you're, you're in tune with something else that just isn't the same as everyone else? Well... That's a two-part question in a way, because I, I had experiences very, very young, as, as young as I can remember, but I never looked at it as different than anybody else. I just thought that's how everyone experienced their life. And I have an identical twin sister named Amy, and she and I would all the time be communicating just what I later learned was telepathically, but where we would have conversations with each other in our minds and the other one would just know what the other one was thinking. And when we would talk to other people, it, you know, any couple that's been together, whether as siblings or husband and wife, they're going to get to know each other so well that they're going to finish each other's sentences or know what to expect. So there's a little bit of, okay, well, was this going on because we just were together every month? moment even before we were born or or was it because we were you know having mind to mind communication but it really did seem like we were so plugged in on that level and then we would have experiences where we were even communicating with each other in our dreams and having shared dreams and then we were also seeing apparitions in our house and we there was one that used to stand in my parents in the doorway of my parents' bedroom. It was a figure of a man and he was filled in with like this, it looked like snow on uh, one of the older TV sets, just like black and white uh, dots 
that filled him up. And every morning, this was when I was about four or five years old. If I wanted to run into my parents' bedroom, I had to get up all my nerve before I was ready to just like run past it. And I would run past it and then it would disappear. And I didn't tell anyone about this for almost a year. And then one day I was talking to my sister and she told me she was seeing the exact same thing. But she hadn't told anyone. So it was from experiences like that, that we knew that there was so much more than just the physical, but we thought this was totally normal. And then we found out as we got older that no, not everyone believed in all of this. And that was a big shock. But I still contend now after having gone through so many more experiences and going through training of many different types of modalities. And now I'm, I've, for the past tw- almost 25 years, I've been training other people in many different kinds of intuitive processes. And I am absolutely positive that this is just part of our normal perception. It's just a, a matter of some people have it more than others or different types initially, but these things can be brought out in people. It, it just takes focusing and understanding understanding how to bring it out. And that's really interesting. You mentioned you've got a twin sister and you always hear people talk about the twin thing or, you know, I, I've got uncles that both broke bones at the exact same time um, uh, on the same day when they were kids, you know, and, and it's crazy time and coincidence, whatever you might want to call it, but there's something to that. And like you say, you, maybe not everyone realizes or has it to the same level that there's something potentially telepathic going on, but it's just there in, in some way, shape or form. Does your sister still through adulthood have the same interest or, or same intuition that she had back then? Yes, definitely. So she is a professional psychic and intuitive and uh, uh, as well as myself, but we've gone on different paths in terms of our approaches to our work. So there's definitely crossover, but she has different, uh, she works with people in a different way and uses different techniques, has some different interests. Uh, So we could talk about that too, like the differences, because a lot of people don't realize how involved it is and, you know, getting down to techniques like are you using visual are you using somatic uh, experiences or letting your body express itself are you auditorily or through mediumship getting impressions so you know some people are using all of these and then some people are using more than others well well, let's talk about that and strip it back then so in your words Deborah because you, you're an expert what is remote viewing how do you put that across to someone uh, in simple terms yes so because people do ask that they say well I'm hearing a lot about remote viewing these days but how is that different from just using your psychic abilities just in other ways and so the term remote viewing people will sometimes use it synonymously with clairvoyance, being able to see information at a distance. But those who call themselves remote viewers, primarily remote viewers, are usually talking about using approaches that came out of a particular historical context. And that context would be the remote viewing programs that were part of the U.S government programs spanning back from the 1970s. And so with those with that approach, remote viewing is really considered more of a setup or a, a particular methodology. Well, I shouldn't say particular. I should say a setup where you're you're tuning into things at a distance where you don't have information about them to begin with. And so there's certain, it really mirrors scientific protocols because you're starting off with as little information as possible. You're going through a systematic approach. You're using your psychic abilities within that approach. And then, and then you're having it carefully analyzed and recorded. So it's really kind of more just the way that you're using your psychic abilities in a more of a formal setup. And it could be very informal, formal, but still a setup or or um, very formalized where everything is structured and done in a particular way. Yes. Uh, so In- Ingo Swan 
was the person who coined the term remote viewing. And yes, his definition, when people would ask him what it was, he said it's more of like an experimental setup than it is just an ability. So, uh, but there's so, so much crossover. So for example, if I just wanted to simply use my clairvoyance, let's say to find a missing wallet or some missing money. I might, if it was my own wallet and it was something, or let's say my husband's that has happened many times, he was looking for something and I needed to help him and he's like, I can't find it. So I could just sit down, close my eyes and wait for an impression to come. And if, if it, the money or whatever's missing happens to be at a landmark that I can easily uh, recognize, then I could just like jump up after 30 seconds and go in and try to find that landmark. So that would be like simple clairvoyance. But if I really, let's say a client wants me to find something like I have a client right now whose great, great grandfather supposedly buried money on an Indian reservation uh, in the 1950s, and she's positive it's there. So I have to find it. So how am I going to approach that? I'm going to do it through formal remote viewing. So this is going to involve sitting down with paper and pen. And I do have to say, even knowing that is more than a lot of times remote viewers know. Sometimes they don't even know they're looking for money. They're just given a target number and said, told to describe this. But I, I do know that, but I'm also going to give the task to my students and not even tell them that it's money. I'm just going to say, do a remote viewing session. So we're going to sit down with a piece of paper and probably go for a couple hours. And we're going to move our consciousnesses all over the location. And like, I'll probably tell myself, I'm going to bring myself in relation to the money. I'm going to touch the money in my imagination. And then I'm going to look around and then I'm going to start recording and sketching everything I get. And then I can go up above like 500 feet and look down and survey the area, get a description of the area. And then I'm going to write that down and do sketches. And then after a few hours, I'll create a, just like a whole map and then give that to the, the client along with a polished summary. So you could see this would be a lot more involved than just I'm tuning in for just a, a couple moments. And can I just ask, this might be a really silly question, but when you say you're going to go up above, do you mean physically? Or is that like an out-of-body type, you know, surveying of the area? Yeah, excellent question. Well, I'm going to imagine, of, of course, it's happening in my imagination. So I'm I'm not there. I'm just in my living room for this whole process because I don't even know where there is. I, I know that it's somewhere out in the wilderness but that's the only thing I know. And that, and I don't even know what country my client's in. So, but what I do know is if the money is there, it exists somewhere. So in my imagination, I'm going to, I'm going to imagine I'm going right to the money and putting my hand on it. And something starts to happen when you do that. Now, it's not like I can just at will have a full blown out of body experience like is some uh, and we could talk about that if you've ever had one. I've I've only had like maybe five times where I really experienced a total separation from my body. But in in this case, what happens is when you imagine yourself somewhere else at a distance, it's almost like it slowly starts to happen. So it's not a full blown one, but it's where you start to have um you you'll have moments of like oh I just suddenly felt wind rush past me, or I just suddenly felt heat, or I could see there's like shadows and big trees up above me. So it's like you start to have impressions. And some of them, it's not just visual impressions, but it is like where your body is actually having sensations of the place. And so while we can't prove that this is actually happening, I do feel like the longer that you are imagining you're at a distant location and you're doing these what's called movement commands going from different perspectives, the longer you stay there and interact, you I, I do feel like a part of our energy field is is becoming integrated with the location. And and so in that respect, it is 
like astral traveling or an out of body experience. It's just not a, a full blown one. So I'm still at many times very, very aware that I'm sitting in my living room or office working with the paper. And I would say that tends to be overall, if you talk to remote viewers, they would probably agree mostly of what I'm describing. Now, some don't feel like they're integrating so much with the target. Some are just like, oh, well, I don't think I'm going anywhere. I'm just, you know, I'm just writing and things are appearing on the paper. And so not everyone has such such a um, disconnected experience, but a, a lot of them do. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily, it's a helpful approach to imagine that you're going out. And that's the thing as I'm talking, like I'm sure some of your listeners are thinking, well, you know, I I do this a lot just spontaneously because you could think of another person. Like let's say you meet like a potential romantic partner. So you start thinking about them and wondering about what it would be like to be with them. And as you're just wondering that, it may not be like you're thinking, oh, I'm going to, you know, go send myself over there. But just where our thoughts go, our energy goes, and our consciousness goes. So if you're really thinking about someone intently, you could just accidentally start to pick up things. Like you might suddenly start to smell smell them or what's around them or you know experience how their body is feeling just not you you may not even believe in psychic stuff but just be thinking of someone so intently and and this is this will happen for some people more strongly than others and it's also it depends who you're thinking about but you could easily then start to pick up aspects of what's going on with them and the thing is if you for people who aren't aware that can happen, they may just suddenly like feel an emotion and not realize like, oh, this isn't even my emotion. This is their emotion, you know, or they might suddenly like I was feeling so, so I, yesterday I was really energetic and then suddenly I just felt so exhausted. I had to go lay down and I found out a short time later that a friend of mine who wasn't feeling well was trying to get in touch with me to see if I would do an energy healing on her. And as soon as I realized that I felt fine, but so this can happen both when we're thinking about other people or when other people start to think about us, especially if they really feel like, Oh, I, you know, I got to get in touch. And, but sometimes we're not aware of the difference. Really interesting use of language that you've used the word imagination quite a lot, but as if imagination is a tool that can be harnessed and used in, in quite a positive sense. Because I think, when especially when you have conversations about remote viewing, UFOs, UAPs, all, all of this sort of subject, anything you want to classify maybe as paranormal, people lo levy the, the accusation. It's, it's all just your imagination, but you're using it in quite a positive sense. Is that the way you see imagination? Yes. I'm so glad that you brought that up. In fact, I, I have done a, a video on this topic. I think it's on my YouTube page. So I, I think we almost need different language or words for these things because, yes, our imagination is absolutely a, a tool or a toolbox, I should say, because within that toolbox, then there's other tools as well. But this is the way that our so so much so that many of our psychic abilities, especially our, our visual ability, can come through. It's it has to work, it's like the fabric or the material of our consciousness. And so the information will flow through it to express itself. Now that's not to say that we can't also use our imagination to come up with things that aren't true or are just part of our logic or are just kind of creative but not connected to the actual target or what we're going for. So so mm -hmm. so I think it is a problem with language as well. And part of it is being able to discern between what is just your own, uh, let's say your own visualizations or your your own thoughts versus what is the actual intuitive information coming in. And, and it still has to use your, you know, something within yourself that you can 
recognize or use. So it is, it is complex. And that's part of the, uh, the training like I do with my students is to learn to how to discern between all of that. But part of it is also really just a lot of practice and a lot of experience because you have to, you have to really know, I call it your baseline, like know your own baseline of your thoughts and your feelings to be able to discern the information. And a lot of times what ends up being wrong is the interpretations of the information as well. So that's like, in, especially in remote viewing, there's a term called analytic overlay. And that has to do with where, you know, you, you see a, um, let's say someone's given you an object to describe and you see something red and round and immediately your mind goes to a tomato and it's not a tomato, it's a red ball, or maybe it's a building that's round and red, but your imagination just comes up. This happens so fast that sometimes it's, it's through logical deduction, like, oh, I see red, I see round must be a, a tomato or an apple, but it can happen spontaneously where you just like get an image of the tomato and apple. And then you didn't even like go through any thought processes. It just appeared. And then you find out, no, it wasn't that, but it was this building that was red and round and who, you know, is used to seeing things like that. So it's, it's working with things like that, where we're really up against our own perception, uh, the, the way our perception works. And, and we're, when we're remote viewing or using any psychic abilities, it's almost like we're having to relearn how to orientate ourselves to our own perceptions. Now, I do also want to say, speaking to your question, that you know people do have to be discerning when they just have some kind of experience, and you know, there's so often there is just logical explanations for things. And one example I like to give: I, I was in Sedona with a friend, and we were taking pictures, and so, suddenly this thing started to appear in our pictures. It, it was like this big glowing thing in the middle of as we were taking pictures of the vortexes and we got so excited we we're just like screaming and screaming and taking as many pictures as we can and then i thought wait a second oh no and then i i thought could this possibly be my thumb and so i went and and tested it out took some pictures of my thumb and it was we had gotten all excited and all it was <laughs> was a finger in the lens with the sun hitting it. So, you know, you got to, when you're having these experiences, you so much have to rule those out, especially before you're going to start announcing to other people that you've just, you know, had this discovery. Yeah. And you know what, that, that's a good sign though, that you can see yourself that you're not going to pass that off as being something it isn't. And God knows as part of the UFO community, we see pictures and I've got listeners every day send me videos and pictures and Andy, look at this. And what do you think this is? And so much of it, it's like, it's interesting, but given it's one source, it's really hard to tell with, with nothing else in a longer video or, you know, a zoom or a close up. but then you get things that are clearly, it's, it's a plane or it's a bird that's flying past, but they want it to be something else so badly that they really don't like when, when they're told, and this goes for Twitter or Facebook or whatever else, that that's not the thing that you, you think it is. And I'm guessing when it comes to remote viewing as well, there's that interpretation of a target. And I want to ask you, because something that's interested me, and you mentioned target numbers. Now, you're, you're not normally told, you know, I suppose when people think of remote viewing in a kind of, sexy hollywood way they think about remote viewing the you know codes to a nuclear launch uh, somewhere or you know go find the, the the russians have this briefcase what's inside the briefcase but normally when i'm seeing people uh do remote viewing online i've seen simeon hein who i've interviewed several times on the podcast and he'll put on his youtube channel a, a list of numbers and you have to remote view those numbers how does that work what are people looking at when they see these numbers because that seems to be for people looking to get into this in quite a basic way as well yeah so the numbers allow to tune into a subject without knowing anything about it in advance so to be blind to it so for example with my example of my client who has this missing money from her grandfather i 
when I want my students to look at it, but I don't want them to even know that they're looking for missing money, I can just take any number and pair that number with the task, so to speak. And I can do that by writing it on a piece of paper or in this case, uh, a document on my computer. And so I label it, I label what I want them to do, like find find the money exactly where it is located now, find, find discernible landmarks to help people searching for it to find it right now in present time, because things might have changed since the 1950s. So I write down what I want their subconscious to go to. And then I have to make a decision, well, what number should I use to give to them to pair with that? So there's different practices for this. Now, I could just come up with any number just at the top of my mind, or I could use a random number generator. Generally, you could use any number. I mean, I could just call it target number one, but because there's been so many target number ones in the world, I might choose to have like eight digits. And I personally like to um, have some meaning attached to it. So what I did was, and actually I'd never done this before, but I went online and looked up codes, like different kinds of codes. And then I put the words, find the money. And then I put the words, find the money into the code generator and it gave me a string of numbers. And then I chose the first eight numbers. And so I'm get, I, I used those numbers and gave them to the viewers. Now, some other project managers, they might use just a date, like the date that the project is due. Uh, but then I sometimes I don't like to do dates so much just because I, I think, well, maybe the date will confuse people. So another thing you could do is longitude, latitude, coordinates, but then just take some numbers just in case anyone might like try to put the longitude, latitude number into the into Google Earth and try to look for it, right? So the strand, I think the numbers are usually somewhere around 10 digits or 12 digits. So I'll take like four digits from one, four from the other, mix them up, and then just put them on a piece of paper. And again, none of that may be necessary because this really does seem to work through intention. So, and again, I'm just giving the numbers it to the viewers so they have something that they can they can hone in on, so they can connect with. And, and some of the methods involve writing the target number on the paper and then tracing the target number with your fingers or your pen or, or doing what's called an ideogram where you write the numbers and you just let your hand make a reflexive mark and then you touch that. So we're looking for a way to bring the, the body into contact with the target number, the target number being a representation of the whole target. And there what are... should someone... So sorry, I was going to. I was just going to ask Deborah, what should someone consider success, especially when they're first starting out and they're they're first trying a set of target numbers? Now, if you pick, you know, the, the Eiffel Tower, you're not looking for, I'm sure, the grand detail of the tower and surroundings. What what sorts of things would you be looking for to think there's definitely something there and that's been successful? Yeah, well, this is where sketching really helps. Like I would always set the rule that. If anyone is doing any kind of task related to describing something physically like the Eiffel target, Eiffel Tower, they're not going to know that's what it is, but they just know there's a location. So they need to sketch. As soon as you get an impression of a shape, you have to sketch the shape. And so this would be very easy for even brand new people. As soon as they get any image that, uh, that could be sketched, they sketch it. And then, so if I wanted to be um, relatively certain that a person was actually describing that, I would expect it to be in a triangle shape. You know, I would expect the sketch to at least resemble, because that's such a, a particular singular um, structure right there. You know, other locations have many different shapes and things going on, but that shape, like you, everyone knows what that looks like. So I would expect that they would have a sketch that would look uh, at least in the the overall shape. I would also expect that they like filled it in with some lines or something tower like, um, and also even to maybe say the word, um, you know, tower, tall, 
um, narrow at the top, taper, tapered, going wider. So descriptions like that, and that that's not something that's a target that would be very easy for for even someone doing this the very first time to describe. So if I wanted to have any confidence that that would be the level that I would expect. But you know, I wouldn't if if this was a test of can the person really, um, you know, do they have psychic abilities or can they really do this? I wouldn't choose the Eiffel Tower just because someone might accuse us of like, oh, they might, that's such a famous place. And we know that other remote viewers have described that. So I wouldn't even choose that as a target because skeptics could just disregard that as, you know, well, maybe they logically thought that was going to be chosen. Some of the most common questions that were sent over to me by listeners, we're not getting to those just yet, but I want to find out what are some of the most intriguing things you yourself have remote viewed in your time? Okay, so most intriguing. Well, you know, let's see, because I have to separate out what are the most interesting targets or ideas of targets versus my most interesting experiences I've had with targets. And the two are really somewhat different. You know, for for me, what's most interesting is when I do have more of that full body experience. Like I was tasked with a target that it I, I don't even quite remember what it was. It was somewhere in the Middle East and it was a building but before I got to the building, I had this image as if I was moving over sand and a desert. And I saw every single grain of sand as I was moving through. And I saw like the sand part and then a scorpion uh, exited this hole. And it was like I could see all the sunlight and feel the heat and moving fast over it. And it was so cool. I got stuck there and I never actually described the building I was supposed to describe. So that, but for me, that was, even though we're just talking about some grains of sand, that really stands out as as such a cool experience. But in terms of interesting targets, I, I recently, maybe about six months ago, did a, a couple sessions for Skinwalker Ranch. So that was interesting. If you're familiar, I would think you're familiar with Skinwalker Ranch. Yeah, yeah, very. Yep. And um, specifically looking into the cattle mutilations. So that was quite interesting. It was a yeah, a little. Could you expand on that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I was. And that was a target where for this particular one, I did know up front what it was. The I was tasked by it by a uh, someone who's been involved in MUFON for many years, one of the board of directors. And he was interested to see what we would come up with in terms of remote viewing, but he did want us to know what we were going to do just ethically. You don't want to give remote viewers things that could potentially be dangerous to look at. So, you know, I I was nervous about it, just in what I might find. I but then I got started and everything was okay. And I and I can tell you what I kind of concluded as far as the cattle mutilations. But what I experienced was I, I did one session, totally fine, no problem. I got more and more comfortable. I did another session, drew like a map of the area. And then on the third day, I was just writing everything up and I was uh, writing a summary of my experiences and I was about to be done. And I, and then I thought, you know, I, I just feel like I haven't yet tuned into like really gotten clearly who is behind all of this. And when I had that thought, I had this pain shoot through my head that was so it felt like my head had just almost exploded. I like I thought I was going to have to go to the hospital and it was like it didn't last long. It only lasted for about a minute, but it was so intense. I I was almost screaming and at that point I was like, "You know what? I'm done." I and I hate being done. Like if I feel like I haven't gotten to something, I will go for like 20 more hours, but I was done with that. But what I felt like might be most interesting to people is 
that I I got a sense that there's something under the ground and there there's something in the the earth in the dirt there there's something that whoever is behind the cattle mutilations they want to test what's actually in the land and so but it will only show up in the tissue of the cows so it's not like they can just um just go and test the the dirt themselves somehow what they're looking for is within the the body of the animal the tissue and so they have to take out this tissue that is going to help them know what is what is under there so it's some kind of valuable um resource that they're testing that they don't want anyone to know is is there um as far as what it is i i don't rem- i did get like different characteristics of it and I, i'd have to go look back at that but that was my sense and i i did in terms of i i felt like these were kind of like pa- paramilitary people but they weren't really with the US government but they they had a very much um military hierarchical feel to them but they weren't just part of the regular military Can I ask Deborah do you know who Thomas Winterton is in relation to Skinwalker Ranch No I don't it's really interesting you describe the, the pain in your head. Thomas Winterton is the ranch superintendent uh, that works on Skinwalker Ranch now. Uh, he's on the TV show and I've interviewed him on the podcast. He's a really nice guy. But um, he had um, a physical ailment from the ranch uh, where he was doing some digging, uh, as as you kind of mentioned, about things being under the ranch. And he ended up with a really strange injury that medically they couldn't explain where the the a layer of fluid developed between his skull and the skin and expanded to a point where he was getting excruciating headaches Um, and he went in and the doctors couldn't explain what this was he was sent off the ranch and it's happened a couple of times um, where he's got these really intense pains in his head so that was just really interesting that you you mentioned that something you sort of experienced yeah wow that is really interesting yeah it's kind of scary because it almost felt like something was actually going on in my head at the moment like that did scare me even talking about it right now like uh, my head's starting to hurt a little bit too can i can i also ask deborah do you worry that there's there's talk with the whole phenomenon uh, if we umbrella the whole subject to UFOs, aliens, remote viewing, everything in between, that there is somewhat of a, a sticky portfolio is the wording that is sometimes used, or a hitchhiker effect. And George Knapp, um, when I interviewed him, discussed that after his time on Skinwalker Ranch, he felt something followed him off the ranch. Thomas Winterton and even government officials have reported that something, a presence, an entity, have has followed them off of the ranch. Is that something that either you've experienced or you worry about when you remote view an area or subject like this? Yes, I would be worried about it. And it's interesting, you know, where I experienced that. Have you heard of East SETI? Is it East SETI or C SETI in Washington State? Yep. And I'm forgetting the, what is the guy's name who runs that? It'll come to me, but it's in Washington State, and it's right near Mount Adams, and it's a retreat center. And you might know John Vivanco. He's a remote viewing instructor, and he had a retreat out there a couple years ago. And so I went to that along with some of my friends, and they had different events going on. And you just, it's a beautiful place. You camp out there, and but they they are constantly having sightings, UFO sightings, and all sorts of weird things going on there. And, you know, I was rather skeptical because, again, I I observed people there who were seeing lights in the sky and immediately assuming that they're UFOs, where I'm, I'm, I have my own airplane, a Cessna 172, and my husband's a pilot, and I'm his navigator co-pilot. So we spend a lot of time up in the air and I know how busy it is up there. You know, there are so many things flying up around at any given time. So to just see lights in the sky and assume that they are UFOs is 
just, you know, that, that kind of bugs me. And I, and I felt like I saw that a lot with the people that were there, they'd get excited about that. But I have to say, so, so one night I was receiving a massage from actually John Vavanko's wife at the time, she, Brooke, she was giving me a massage. And as I was just laying there and it was in this like pyramidal structure where the owner has like his office or his meditation center and there's massage up above. And as I was lying there, I was seeing the weirdest images. Like I'm just laying there and I would just clairvoyantly, but in, like in technicolor, just these weird faces. And like, I wouldn't say those looked alien. They just look like half human, half dog, just very like di- combinations of animal people looking things. So that was really weird. And then I went home from, I was there for about three days camping out. And I went home and the first night I was lying there and I started just hearing this profanity, like being yelled out at me. And, you know, it it just, it's in my ears. So it wasn't on the outside. So it was telepathically, but, you know, I don't usually have that kind of language, like just running through my head. And then just, again, those images, like one after another, like, you know, faces just coming flying at at you at at me and so that i would say um i i was sure that i had picked up some stuff from there and i would say that continued for about a week i had to do i did meditations i did healings on myself i had i have so many friends and students who are healers so i had them work on me and i'm someone where i I believe that, yes, you have to psychically protect yourself and clear yourself. At the same time, a lot of times people's fear of these things uh, create a whole lot more problems than the things themselves, you know, so it's just like anything else. Sometimes, you know, you've got an obnoxious neighbor or you've got, you know, you have an argument with someone and you got to just kind of clear that up. I look at the same thing. I I don't want to get dramatic or upset about these things. But in that case, I would say it it took me a good week to 10 days to just clear that out where it stopped happening. And thankfully, though, like, I, you know, again, I've been doing this for over two decades. So I can be aware when that kind of stuff happens. But if if I wasn't and just I suddenly started like hearing profanity or, you know, having these thoughts in my head, I might think it was, you know, just me or that there's something wrong with me or I'm going crazy. But because I know these are not typical things that happen to me, you know, there, there's something going on. So for that reason, like I'm not going back to that ranch, even though some of my, it was fun. And, you know, some of my friends have invited me to other events, but I'm just like, no, there, there's, there's something wrong there. And I, and I know that actually one night when we were there, about four different people had really bad nightmares. And and a couple of the guys woke up in the middle of the night, including the owner. I, his name is James, I think. Um, shoot, it'll come to me. But the, the guys got up and did some kind of ceremony because they all, and one did see flashing lights outside of his tent. But again, I wasn't sure. Maybe it was just someone going to the bathroom with a flashlight. But they, but, but they had like a shared dream of like really disturbing things in the dream. And so they got up and did a ceremony and, you know, felt like that helped. I wasn't part of that. I just heard about it the next morning. That's really interesting. I, I don't blame you for not wanting to experience that again. And it's a, it's a lot to take on uh, for yourself emotionally and physically. Listen, I, I do want to get on to the book as well, because I've got a whole lot of questions to get to from listeners. Now, um, the book is released or was released on the 25th of August, and it's called Associative uh, Associative Remote Viewing, The Art and Science of Predicting Outcomes for Sports, Politics, Finances and the Lottery. Now, that is going to raise some eyebrows straight away for people looking to make a quick buck as well, I'm sure. Um, And that's a good one for the search engines. So it was written by yourself, John Knowles, and others are attributed to it. Do you want to talk a little bit about what the book's about, Deborah? Sure. Well, it is just about that, using your psychic abilities to be able to predict future outcomes. And they could be outcomes for the stock market, for cryptocurrency, for horse racing, for football games, soccer games, uh, just anything that you would want to be able to predict, including including getting lotto numbers. So 
uh, and really this book is a historical overview and it is some people are calling it like a triste or a manifesto uh, because it's almost 800 pages long and it covers not just what was done in the in the way past but w- a lot of what people are doing these days in these areas. So a, a lot of people new to this don't realize how much is happening where there's groups of people, both individuals and groups that work together to very diligently and somewhat in a scientific manner. So some some are like doing formal scientific research projects in this area, and those projects are getting published in formal journals. And then others are, they're, they're not going as far as as like writing up their projects formally, but they get together, they have a plan, they say how many trials they're going to do. And then they do repeated attempts at using remote viewing to and and other approaches that involve psychic abilities in order to get to have an advantage so that they can make predictions and either win money or just see how many hits they can get. So a lot of people involved in this are, um, some are very interested in making money. That's primarily why they're into it. But I would say so many are just wanting to see what is humanly possible with our psychic abilities. You know, can we really even tune into the future and can we do it well enough so that we can find out about an outcome before it happens. And so sometimes they're not wagering, but they're just recording their statistics to try to get their numbers up. And there's different processes. I can see one of the one of the early five-star reviews of the book, Deborah, is very complimentary. It's a five-star review, so it's going to be. But it also talks about the book being an incredible introduction to the subject for someone new to remote viewing as well. So that's obviously really good. Can I, can I just ask, though, and again, this maybe is a little bit of bias from watching TV and movies over the years as well. You tend to find or see when it, a narrative is written about this subject that it's almost a no-no to morally gain a profit from things like this is that something that's just not necessarily true and there's nothing actually wrong with you know predicting lottery numbers as such yeah you know i think we have to there's definitely people who think that it that when it comes to your intuitive ability that's something spiritual and so it's unethical to to use these abilities for financial gain or personal gain. And that's, you know, people are entitled to their beliefs, but uh, on a couple levels, well, first, I believe that, that everything we do is a gift. You know, people are gifted with being able to um, do be accountants or architects or athletes or artists or musicians or singers you know how but but we don't have a problem that someone who has a beautiful voice and and then has trained to even develop it further we don't have a problem that they not even make money but some of them are the richest people in our society right same thing with people who have yeah. sports abilities but how is that not a gift from god you know but but then our psychic abilities are somehow different so i think these are these are ideas that oftentimes come out of religion, specific religious or like Christian ideology uh, of what. And when you, when you look into like who is against even using psychic abilities or even like the whole topic, it, yes, you find like skeptics, but you also uh, who call themselves scientists but aren't like really being very scientific about it if they're so opinionated. And then there are the reli- different religious groups that say, you know, all of this is the work of the devil or you should only be always in service to to people around these topics. But um, so there's that. And then there's also the idea, like I look at it as – we have we have our regular physical senses like okay it's okay for me to know things in life with using my eyes and my ears that's okay but i can't use the other aspects of myself to know things like it almost makes me feel like people would be saying oh well you know you you need to blind yourself and put earplugs in your ears and not think because 
you're because you're somehow cheating if you're using your other uh, natural uh, perceptual abilities. You know, it's just kind of silly. So are we really meant to be stumbling around in the dark, not knowing what's going to happen, either what is happening truly around us or what is going to be happening? And just because a lot of times we don't know what's going to be happening doesn't mean there should be anything wrong if we're taking a peek at it into the future. And, you know, maybe I, I do think that if enough people did know how to look into the future, if, and I'm, I'm not saying that I even think that everything, we can see everything in the future. I think that there's some things that are set that we can see. I think there's probabilities that we could tune into. And then there's a lot of stuff that's not, even, it just doesn't exist. So we can't even see it or, or access it. So I think there's all that going on. But I think that if enough people were doing this, it actually might change our consciousnesses or the way that we we are as humans. And, you know, you could get into, well, is that a good thing or not? I don't know if you talk to older people from, you know, say, I mean, I'm 53 years old at the moment. And I know a lot of people that think the way life is going with everyone being so technologically oriented, you know, they're they're really down on how humans are progressing right now, the older people. But, you know, are they right? No, it's just their opinions. So, so we, I, I think that we are moving along in our evolution as humans closer and closer to more and more people having full, a lot fuller access to their, their intuitive abilities than we've ever been before. And I do think that's going to change us. And that does open up a lot of ethical questions, but I don't know that there's any right and wrong there. Now, I'll put all the details for the book within the description of the show as well. So if people want to check that out, it's available via Amazon. But also, if you want to support your your local bookstores, that's always promoted as well and encourage folks. Um, I That's probably a nice way to segue into the listener questions, Deborah, because you've brought something up. And my co-host, Dan, who, um, I was talking to him about speaking to you and any questions he wanted me to bring up. And you've mentioned, you know, potentially if more people were in touch or in tune with these abilities, how would it change society for the good or for the better? Now, Elon Musk, um, he wants to bring out Neuralink, which is a way for us to all, it's a chip in your brain and it's going to connect us all. And, you know, you have access to information and sharing. And do you think technology is a kind of bridge between us getting to that stage or would that potentially be harmful in people accessing these types of abilities? That is all for this week's show. Thank you very much for listening. Please remember to leave the podcast a review on your chosen platform. You can like, retweet and subscribe. That would all be very much appreciated. The shows are being uploaded onto YouTube as we speak more and more. You can sign up at patreon.com forward slash that UFO podcast to access the shows ad free as well. Please get in touch on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, that UFO podcast. Of course, on Twitter, it's at UFO, U-A-P-A-M. And again, folks, as always, keep looking up. You never know what you might see. It wasn't a tic-tac and not quite a saucer, more like a hubcap designed by Chaucer, a little baroque and quite steampunk, like Alice was playing bass for the Parliament of Fire. The little fucker hovered right outside of my window, and when I shut out the screen, he made it an issue. I don't think he expected me to see his ass, but I'd had some champagne and smoked a little bit. Meditative game of fate full on meta. I can't imagine how it could have been any better. I got to the top of the stairs and there he was. Like, you awake? I was about to abduct you, cuz. back and nearly kissed myself, and I climbed out the window after the elf, and I woke up in my bed, and there was something on my head, and everything was weird, and everything was red, I called up my boys, they thought this was noise, they thought it was a dream, they thought it was my toys, they thought it was my problems, and they think I should take care of me, and I don't know what it is, because it doesn't really scare me.
Consider your heart. Consider time. Consider your space. Consider your lies. Consider your life. Consider.